Uh, is it seen as airbrushing history? Is that what you think it is? Or is this actually a massive step forward in erasing racism in our society? Joining us now, a journalist from the Guido Fawkes site, Tom Harwood, who joins us from Cambridge. He believes councils should not bow to pressure from angry protesters. Professor Kehinde Andrews from Birmingham City University, who thinks it's about time some of these sta statues were taken down. Tom Harwood, did you have an issue with the Colston statue being dragged down by angry protesters in Bristol? I think the bigger issue with Colston was not the, that it was taken down, but the way in which it was taken down. This is sort of ceding political authority from elected representatives towards uh, small groups of people on the streets. And I don't think that's necessarily a good way to run society. And it opens up a precedent that is quite worrying and quite damaging. Let me, in this Tom, country, Tom Harbour, let me, let me give you law. a... Tom, we, we talked to Nigel Farage yesterday and it, was, it got quite a fiery in the debate. So let me just try and have a calmer one with you. Just, I'm trying to work out really where the line gets drawn here. Nigel Farage said that he had, uh, he supported Germany's democratic decision to remove all statues of Hitler, for example, and that he personally agreed with that. He wouldn't make the same commitment on Colston. What is your view? I mean, was, was Germany right in your view to remove all statues of Hitler? Of course it was, and that was a contemporaneous event. Uh, people removed statues of Hitler immediately in the aftermath of his terrible, horrific, fascistic reign. I think it's different when we're looking at statues that have stood for 200, 300 years. So do you perhaps, personally think, okay, but do you, do you, personally, do you personally think Colston, uh, Nigel Farage said it, if it was a democratic decision, which they tried to do in Bristol, but it's got nowhere. But if there was a democratic decision to remove it, would you support the removal of, say, Colston or Milligan's statues based on their history as slave owners and slave traders? What do you feel personally about that? I think there's a line that we can draw here with regard to how people are remembered. I mean, we're looking today at protesters, for example, saying that we should tear down statues of Francis Drake or James II or Horatio Nelson. I don't think that that is entirely appropriate. However, when it's people who are primarily remembered for horrific deeds or for slavery, um, there's perhaps more nuance there. But obviously, this is something that we shouldn't do in a rash way. We shouldn't do in a quick way and we shouldn't do uh, in a way that is... Okay. Okay. Well, that, can I, can I, sorry, can I just say, so we Tom, Tom Harwood, if there was a statue still um, existing of Hitler uh, anywhere in the world, are you saying you would only support it being taken down if there was a democratic vote? And if a group of protesters went and tore down a statue of one of the most hated people in history, you wouldn't have supported it? I think this is a reductio ad absurdum. We are looking at this country, at statues in this country. Of course, if there are a statue of Hitler in this country, I would be one of the first people calling for it to be removed. OK, it and if a group of protesters then went statues. and removed it, would you say you shouldn't have done that because you should have waited for a vote of the council? I would have hoped that councils would have removed it in the first place. I think that when we get into tricky territory is when we say that sort of vigilantism on the street trumps democratic politics. I, I think it's right to question the Labour Council in, uh, in, in Bristol. I think it's right to question the Labour Mayor in Bristol for why they didn't uh, talk about this statue earlier and remove it earlier. But I'm not sure the precedent of people uh, going and, and, and taking justice into their own hands is a how good one. How did you feel then? I asked, I asked again Nigel Farage's question, but how how did you feel, for example, uh, like Nigel Farage, I opposed the Iraq war, but I can't pretend I wasn't, you know, pretty pleased to see Iraqi citizens who'd been oppressed by him rip down his statue in what was a very defining moment because it showed the world Saddam had actually lost control when he was pretending he was winning the war. I mean, did you honestly, be honest now, did you look at that footage and think this is a bad thing? No, of course I didn't. It was completely right to tear down that statue in a contemporaneous setting. This is the fundamental difference. No, but defeating the contemporaneous fascism, setting at the moment is that Black Lives Matter, Tom Harwood. Of course they do. It's of the, course it, Black Lives it's Matter. The, yeah. the it's contemporaneous the moment, Tom Harwood, is that it's George the, Floyd, the George Floyd footage happened just two weeks ago. Anyone who watched that footage, black or white, doesn't matter where you're from, could not have looked at it. I'm sure you, you, I'm sure you did. Uh, I think you said this. It was horrific. We know this, right? But you see, you're making an interesting distinction between 
you think it's right if it's contemporaneous. And yet what people in Bristol would say is, this just happened. Mm. And now we've, we've now had a light shone on the fact that we have a slave owner, slave trader statue standing over us like some white supremacist and we want to get rid of it. I, I think it's a tenuous thing to say that because it's not con as contemporaneous as the atrocity just happening, that it shouldn't have the same logic applied to People it. feel it's utterly contemporaneous. Yes, of course, and you're picking the most contentious example, and um, that's that's quite right. This is this is probably a statue that we can have a very serious discussion about. But let's look at the precedent this is setting, and let's look at statues of, for example, Nelson, of, for example, uh, James II, of, for example, Robert Peel. These are all people that uh, are not primarily known for being involved in slavery. They're people that have... Yeah, uh, and I think you're making a good point. I want to bring in Candy. I think you make a good point. When, when they target Candy Andrews, when people target Churchill or Nelson or these great heroes to many people in this country, I think they lose, they lose support and therefore it becomes slightly self-defeating. Let me ask you about two Nelsons, Candy. Lord Nelson... Many people calling for that statue to be removed. But there's the statue of Nelson Mandela in Parliament Square. Nelson Mandela, for a very long time, was considered a criminal. He served 27 years in prison. He was viewed as a terrorist by many people. He openly admitted, I'm no saint. I did things which I, I think were wrong. I wasn't perfect, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in many ways, to many people, a tainted hero. And yet the overall picture of Mandela is that he was a magnificent figure who actually did magnificent things. So, so where is that line? Would you remove Lord Nelson's statue? And if you would, by the same logic, would you remove Nelson Mandela's? I mean, are we really going to cheapen the debate and compare Nelson Mandela to slave traders? I mean, Lord Nelson was also involved in the slave trade as well. These are very different things. I mean, the history you talk about, the people who didn't like Mandela, that was essentially racism. Mandela was never a terrorist. He was a... He was somebody who fought for freedom. I mean, you could just not compare the two. Well, he used, he used violence. And listen, I, I, I rape Mandela along with Churchill. Well, hang on, let me finish, Candy. Let me finish. Let me finish what I'm saying. I, I rate Mandela along with Churchill as the two greatest people of my lifetime. I, I had the pleasure of meeting him. He's a remarkable, he was a remarkable man. And he came out as a man of peace, but he went into prison as a man who advocated violence for political uh, ambition. And he's admitted himself... He admitted himself that he did that. So my point is, my point is, you can construct a negative about Mandela as you can about Churchill and others. Where is that line? Well, I just want to really point this out that the two people you mentioned, Winston Churchill and Lord Nelson, are both famous for what? Violence. I mean, levels of violence which pale in comparison to the small amounts of violence that Mandela committed. I mean, the key thing about this is, you know, what is the history that we want to remember? Statues are not about history. You don't learn history from walking around the street. You learn history from schools, etc. It's what is the version of history we want to present. And do you want a version of history which is slave traders, colonialists, murderers, fascists? Is that what you want in your public space? That's the debate that we're having. And I think it is at high time that we get rid of these statues. However, however we get rid of them. Yeah. Because it's not like these campaigns have been going for years. And it's time. Sometimes, you know, if you want to make an omelette, you have to crack some eggs. Would you want to get rid of Churchill's statue then, Candy? I think look, Churchill did some good, certainly. But let's be honest, Churchill was also responsible for the deaths of millions of black and brown people. Churchill was a eugenicist. In fact, Churchill and Hitler probably would have agreed on many things when it comes to race. Come on, <laughs> Candy. You see, this is the trouble, Candy. When you say, we've had this debate before, and this is where you, this is where you don't just lose me, you lose the vast majority of the British public. Yeah, to try and equate Churchill to Hitler is deeply offensive no, to people. It's not deeply... I'm sorry. You actually, that's one of the, the, the things we don't understand about the racism of the Nazis. Eugenics, University of Central London, where they'll be tearing down statues soon. Churchill was a, was a member of... He was believed in eugenics. And actually, those beliefs that led to the extermination of the Jews were not that different than the beliefs that led to the slavery of us. They came from the same place. So actually, there are far more continuities than we'd like to... And we have to understand it. And that's, and, Winston and Churchill, and Winston no, Churchill important. stood up, yeah. Winston Churchill, so, forgive me for interrupting, but I've got to defend Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, when this country was threatened with the greatest threat to its civilization we ever had from Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, and when it looked like the odds were insurmountable, he almost single-handedly rallied this country to defeat the most racist person there's ever been. So to try, you know, again, I, I can paint a picture to you, but that's why I said to you, that's why I said to you, you can paint a negative picture of the early life of Nelson Mandela too. 
It, many it's people did. No, but it's not Kehinde, a bad idea. I, I, I'm not equating it. them, but when you're going to equate Churchill to Hitler, you're making an equivalence, which I find offensive too. But it's not offensive. It's the reality that actually, if you look at eugenics and look at his views at the time and look at the views of the Nazis at the time and why the Nazis were able to come to power, it's because the idea of racial science of eugenics was quite popular in Europe and America. It wasn't so separate. And actually, Churchill was one of those people. And I think this is one of those interesting moments because it's very easy mm -hmm. to say, look, George Floyd's killing was terrible. We all saw that it's bad. It's America. But we have to have some real conversations about racism in this country. And that does mean looking at people like Churchill differently. And honestly, but you're not prepared. See, what's interesting is you're not prepared, and I say this respectfully, because I want to have a nuanced debate about this, but you're not prepared, it seems to me, to accept any criticism of Mandela, even though Mandela himself criticised himself. A saint, I, I wasn't a saint. He criticised his I'm own... You know, he used violence for political uh, motivation. Now, I actually think it was... You know, if you look at Mandela in totality, he's a great man, like Churchill. But it's interesting to me that you're not prepared to countenance any criticism of Mandela, but you are prepared to equate Churchill to Hitler. And that's no, where I think no, there's no... You know, that that seems big, to me big, your big, view big. of it is skewed. No, believe me, Piers, I'm a bigger critic of Mandela than you are. In fact, I think that one of the reasons we deify <laughs> Mandela is because he went away from violence, which is probably necessary, interestingly. I'm not making this about violence or non-violence. And your defense of Churchill is that he was violent and got rid of Hitler. The question here is about racism, about the views that they had about society and what kind of world we want. And honestly, Winston Churchill did not want an equal society. He was a racist, he was a eugenicist, he was deeply classist. And the, the world that you think he would have built is not the world at all that matches the world that you Okay, let's bring okay. in Tom, Tom Holland. Let's bring, let's bring Tom back. Tom, you know, it's, there are lots of arguments about all these people. There are very few perfect people that have ever led a country, certainly not during wartime and so on. Churchill and Mandela, depending on who you talk to, you can have arguments about their flaws, about their good sides and so on. Ultimately, I look at these people in totality. It does seem to me there is a, a fundamental difference, though, between the argument about slave owners and slave traders and about leaders like Gladstone, Churchill, Nelson, Mandela and others who had who, who, the totality of what they achieved far outweighed perhaps the negatives. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. What is important here is what people are primarily known for. So, of course, we can talk about people like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson who owned slaves. But actually, was that what they were known for? And is that what they are celebrated for? Absolutely not. We should think about people for what they contribute to society. Nelson wasn't known as a slaver. He was known as someone who defeated Napoleon. Um, there are plenty of people in this country, um, throughout the history of this country, who have engaged in the terrible, horrific, injustifiable practice of owning other people. But in a time when they did that, when everyone did that, when every culture, every society, every continent engaged in that dreadful practice that is now thankfully being squashed out, and I'd note that the UK was one of the first countries in the world to abolish that practice, uh, is it right that we apply the same morality to people today that, that, that we do to people hundreds of years ago? I'm not sure that we're using the proper context here. Should we tear down the Colosseum because people, uh, because slaves fought in it? Should we tear down clear right, patches? Can you Kehinde, you're rolling your eyes in a way that even... I've sure. not even seen Susanna Reid roll her eyes like you are, Kehinde. So come was, on. That was an impressive eye roll, Kehinde. Oh, oh, thank you. I, I, come on. I mean, this is, this, is, this is the debate here. I mean, A, anti-slavery protests have been going on for centuries. And partly about this, well, what are they most known for, is about the rewriting and whitewashing of history. Actually, to black people, George Washington is most known for owning slaves. Because that's what he did. You can't separate those things out. It's only I because think that's we, absolutely ridiculous. That we do that. Well, I mean, of course it is. I, I mean, think, I think if you asked anyone, you black or white, in this country or anywhere white. else, what is George right. Washington known for? It would be as founding America, not as owning no. slaves. No. I mean, let's no. not, re no. let's no. not no. reduce no. the point. No. America you have, you have valid points to make about people who literally spent their lives dedicated to subjugating other human mm. beings on the base of race. I that is valid. And you reduce your point. You, you undermine that. You start George saying Washington spent his life in uh, oppressing black people, he owned black people. Well, How I are you think, saying that's not? I think what we're do, what we're actually doing is in this moment learning a lot more about historical figures. I just want to bring it back to popular culture, mm. Professor Kindy Andrews, because um, Little Britain has been removed from BBC iPlayer, Britbox, Netflix um, amid concern about the use of blackface characters. 
Uh, here we have David Walliams uh, playing one of those characters. Matt Lucas has previously said if he could go back and make the series again, he would not have those black characters. Um, Professor Gindi, how offensive is it to see those on screen? I mean, there's not much more offensive in popular culture than blackface. And I mean, I remember at the time being appalled at this and Little Britain wasn't like it was in the 50s or the 60s. It was 2003. And it just shows you just how badly misunderstood and how bad the representation is that it ever should have, it should never have been put on. And it certainly shouldn't have been put on, a, on an iPlayer. And it's, it's about time it's come down, but it's a shame it's taken the death of somebody thousands of miles away to start looking at racism in Britain. Tom Harwood, I mean, it is hard to, when you look at that footage, it is offensive. You know, times move. You know, I can't remember how I felt at the time. I've never been a big fan of Little Britain, but I can't remember how I felt at the time. But, you know, this is the 2000s here we're talking about. And to have that kind of imagery and depiction, we saw uh, Keith Lemon, I thought, very movingly actually accept his own culpability in doing this and the damage it may have caused in the uh, imagery that he perpetrated of this. What's your view? Yeah, I think it shows actually how far we've moved on as a society in the last 20 years. Because if we look back to anyone in light entertainment in this country now, actually, there's a pretty checkered history there. Whether it's Sasha Baron Cohen, Anton Deck, Mitchell and Webb, all of these people engaged in um, that sort of uh, comedy that I don't think is, is as palatable today as it was 20 years ago. However, does that mean that we should wipe all of their content from the... Uh, from the streaming services that we enjoy today, I'm not so sure. I mean, we had this big argument a couple of months ago about Friends and how the TV show Friends, wildly popular now, being put back on Netflix. Lots of people are enjoying it, but actually watching it and its 90s comedy uh, is, is kind of uncomfortable for a lot of people. There's a lot of transphobia and homophobia in there. Does that mean it should be removed? Absolutely not. Should this show be wiped from uh, the archives because of Piers Morgan's... Uh, um, rants about trans people and, and, and pretending to be a penguin or whatever. I, I don't think that that necessarily means... Well, I could put up a good argument history. for why that wasn't remotely transphobic, but I get your point. I mean, if you go back over any programme, uh, Kihindi, uh, you know, if you go back 20 years on anything, you could probably find something offensive. You know, I mean, John Legend, the singer, even tried to rewrite the lyrics to um, Baby It's Cold Outside because he found it was offensive in light of Me Too, which I found absurd. So where, again, again, where is that line? You know, I can look at that David Walliams uh, uh, imagery and find that offensive, and particularly in light of what's been happening in the last two weeks. But how far do we expunge completely any well, form of comedy that might be offensive now that wasn't at the time? Well, I think there is a discussion to have about what where, where the line is, but blackface is not in the discussion. Blackface is totally offensive. Yeah. It should never have happened, like I said. There's a bigger question, actually, about you know, when we're collecting what goes in them, what we keep in our cultural memory. You know, why haven't we kept... What, what happened to the real McCoy? Mm. That was a really good black comedy with the, B, with the BBC, but they lost all the tapes because they don't really care about it. Where's Desmond? There's other things you can watch, you know? And actually, it's about maybe we should think, like, what things can we pick up from the past and bring back that would actually better make us understand the world today? Because in some ways, actually, it's funny that we don't have some of these shows like Real McCoy, Desmond's, they've gone. And actually, that would be a much better use of time for your Netflix. Tom Harwood, do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> I think we should certainly be promoting uh, black comedy. I think that's, that's excellent. However, what we're, what we're talking about here is the removing of wildly popular TV shows from uh, decades ago that, that are actually... Oh, Bernard Manning, shows Bernard, which, which are offensive Bernard to a Manning, significant Bernard number Manning was of wild, people. Bernard Manning was wildly popular. I went to see him once. I was sent to review his show at Maidenhead Working Men's Club. And I trotted down with my pinstripe suit and a briefcase. And I don't think I've ever had a more shocking, extraordinary experience in my life. Now, a lot of his humour was very funny and everyone was laughing out loud, but a lot of it was deeply offensive. It was racist, it was sexist, and so on. Um, and there was a decision taken that he was no longer appropriate for television. You know, Jim Davison and people like that have had similar uh, responses from TV executives. That, that, that brand of humour is no longer acceptable. Well, I mean, would you, if Bernard Manning was still here, Tom Howard, would you think he, someone like him should be allowed to say the same stuff on television that he was doing before on television? I don't think any sensible commissioner of television would commission a show from him if he were here today. However, let's talk about... No, but my point is, context, my point is do, 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 would you agree with them? Because he used to be on television a lot. He was hugely popular. And yet his brand of humour was very sexist, homophobic, racist. 
you now think he, he shouldn't be on now, but why? What's the, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that society has moved on, and that's a good thing. We have moved on to a place where we don't commission shows like this anymore. However, the discussion we're having is should those be available for people to look back? Well, should Bernard Manning's shows the then be available? OK, so let's take that point. Should Bernard Manning's old shows be available on the BBC or ITV hubs and platforms? Now, I'm in the unfortunate position of never having seen any of Bernard Manning shows. Or perhaps or not, the fortunate um, position. particularly about that. Um, perhaps, perhaps. And I'm someone who, you know, grew up in the early 2010s when Come Fly With Me was the big show on TV. So that obviously colours my judgment. However, um, there's a difference between commissioning new things and holding things in archive and perhaps showing the context through which society has moved yeah, but on. Bernard I Manning, Bernard Manning, I, Bernard Manning if you put that stuff on, on a platform now, it would be very offensive to people. It would be far worse than anything Little Britain ever did. And that's my point. So I think well, so, that so this sort of blanket, we can't, we can't I mean, get rid of stuff um, because, you know, we can't. I don't really buy that argument. Candy? Well, they, let's put the black and white minstrel show back on. It was on BBC not that long ago. No I mean, this, that. when you're creating these kind of histories of culture in there, you are saying what is it? What's worth watching today? You know, yeah. what you don't turn on Netflix to get history. You turn on to be entertained. So if it's not appropriate, then you don't, shouldn't be in the archive. And there's plenty okay. of things that aren't in the archive. OK, you know what? It's, it's been a very good debate. I mean, I think actually what's interesting about this debate, we've had a long chat, and we've probably reached quite a few points of unexpected consensus amid... Division. And that's the way we have to go. I think the part of the problem with all these debates is it's got so tribal in its nature with social media that people come at this from, I can't be seen to back down about anything and I can't be seen to agree with the other side about anything. And actually, that in itself is really troublesome to me because democracy is about engaging with people that you have a different view and reaching points of agreement. That's how you get stuff done. That's how you evolve and move on. So I thank you both for a very interesting discussion. Appreciate it. Tom Harwood, Professor thank Kindy, you. Andrews, good to see you both. See, that's the kind of debate I think we need more of, isn't it? Because you need, you've got to introduce nuance to this, you know. And by the way, I'm looking at myself over the years. And I'm not absolving myself from blame for part of that. You can get very dogmatic about stuff and think your view is the only one that is right rather than your view is an opinion and it can be challenged and you might actually back down and you might find somebody else's opinion quite interesting if you listen hard <laughs> enough maybe i'm talking to myself here <laughs> let's watch um, good morning britain on itv we're going to talk to omid Jalili and uh, neil razor ruddock next <laughs>